thanks for being here. Uh, we, we are still, uh, we're at Albert Hill, obviously, but we still have not had the auditorium fixed, but at the last meeting at Mary Munford, somebody mentioned that it was such a cozy feel in the Munford cafeteria, and they thought this would be good, or they mentioned that having it at the cafeteria at Albert Hill, so it's not exactly cozy, so I'll wander around later. Um, but here we are. Uh, we'll hopefully get the auditorium ceiling fixed over the summer. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm a little bit out of order tonight. Uh, Glenn has other things in his life that he needs to tend to other than his three children and wife, and he is a busy man these days. So I'm going to let Glenn go first because he needs to get out of here and uh, go handle other business. So school's update from Glenn. Yeah, thank you, John. Hey, everybody. Uh, Glenn started with Noria. Um, two big developments uh, since the last time I saw you all uh, with regard to the schools. Uh, the first, can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Okay. Two big developments uh, in the school system since the last time uh, I saw you all. First is the facilities task force. This is a large group of, of 30 or 40 folks uh, from the community of all different backgrounds who uh, we brought together um, to look at our entire school systems, infrastructure, and facilities and come up with a plan about how we can work to eliminate the number of uh, unused uh, seats and space that we have throughout the school system. Right now we've got about 5,000 empty seats uh, school system wide. Uh, which is a big drain on resources that we can't otherwise shift and spend in the classrooms teaching kids. <clears throat> and as is always uh, a challenge in recent years, we've got, unfortunately, uh, more space than we need. So the Facilities Task Force has come up with a, uh, a plan with five different options, um, all the way from doing nothing, which is obviously not an option, to sort of a Cadillac uh, level plan. Uh, and we are in the process of digging into that information and um, working to come up with a workable plan that's fiscally responsible, but that's also going to get our school system on the right track to efficiently using our space, um, but making sure that our kids are not going to school in classrooms where the ceiling tiles are falling on their heads. Uh, so that's a, a, a big development that we're working on right now that I'll keep you all posted on. Uh, second thing is we finalized the school systems budget last night. Um, a couple of the highlights, I, I worked to try to get a 2% raise for teachers. Uh, we were able to get ultimately a 1.7% salary increase, um, which is different than a raise um, because we're actually asking the teachers to work three days extra. And that's part of the school system, the superintendent's academic improvement plan is to have the teachers come in for these three additional professional development days, which will be paid for. Um, but that's, uh, that was one of the big pieces of it. Um, and that was, that was a decision of the school board, not city council. John is, uh, and city council have always been very good partners uh, in working together on how, how we uh, allocate funds. Uh, but my colleagues on the school board, you know, reasonable people can disagree, did not agree with uh, my proposal to go with that 2% raise uh, for teachers, which is what the counties had done. That was sort of my justification for seeking that, was to maintain competitive levels with the counties. Um, that's really about it. I'd be happy to take any questions. I know I get calls and emails from folks when there are school buses driving down your street uh, too fast and dangerously. Um, we try to work on that, but please continue to let me know. You can get my email address and my cell phone number. Um, if you go to the school systems website, that's all there. Anybody have any questions? No chance. Okay. Right. Well, thank you again, thank John. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate it. And uh, please reach out to me by cell phone and email. I'll be happy to talk with you offline about anything. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, go ahead and uh, jump over to regular public safety update. We I uh, got Commander Williams and Lieutenant Stith. I don't know which one of y'all is uh, going to join us. And, and, and I, I, I don't know if you heard, uh, originally we had had uh, Chief Durham on the schedule to attend tonight. That got delayed to our July meeting because the Chief is at, he was going to do time at Councilman Hilbert's, 
town meeting tonight as well as this one uh, but he was asked to speak to a veterans group uh, at seven o'clock tonight and so since he's a 17 year veteran of the marine corps i thought that was more important and and more fitting for him to do that so he will join us july 28th at our town hall meeting but uh, commander williams and lieutenant stiff can answer any questions that you've got also cox too come on up also cox <laughs> Well, most of you know me, I'm Lieutenant Mike Stiff. Commander Williams is here with me today. He's the precinct commander, so I'm going to let him introduce himself and talk to you a little bit with any type of questions that you have, and we'll fill those afterwards. But right now, just off the top of the cuff, we, we're flying high. We're doing good. We have no issues in this particular district. That's up in Carrytown, but that's a little bit outside of your, out of your area. We had a robbery in broad daylight, but we're working on that uh, to alleviate that problem for the weeks to come. But for your district, Crime, I'm happy with the way things are going in the district. Crime is down. The uh, shed problem that we were having is dissipating. Just for a moment, we still have to be vigilant, though. <laughs> That's some motor vehicles. They're still happening, but they're down. So I'm happy with everything. But I think Officer Cox has a lot to do with most of what's going on. So I give him and all my folks the uh, credit. But at this time, we'll let uh, Commander Wayne introduce himself and talk to you a little bit, and we'll fill any questions that you may have. Right. I'm not going to take up much of your time. I try to get around to as many of the district meetings, community meetings. My name is Emmett Williams. I'm the captain of the first precinct. That's where I used to work. Third precinct out here in the West End. I've been on the job now 29 years. I was born and raised here in Richmond, Virginia. We lived just up the street here for a short time on Patterson Avenue. But my roots are south side of Dogtown. Uh, so I was south side of Dogtown boy. And uh, I'm happy to be out here in the West End with you guys. Mike is being very generous. He's doing an outstanding job. Last week, he only had seven crimes out here in the West End. That's phenomenal. Anytime you can keep it in the single digits. And a lot of that good work goes to our bike officer, Todd, for doing the work that he does out here. Overall, for the year, we are below where we were last year. We, we had a tremendous year last year out here in the West End and in the precinct for an 8% reduction. You're trending at 11% in the precinct as a reduction for crime. Mikey here's carrying the precinct, he's at 17%. So the hard work that he's doing and the guys out here in the West End and all over, even over the South Side, is, uh, is a, a tribute to the department, as well as you guys giving us a call. My number is 646-1727. Feel free to call me anytime if you have any crime concerns or issues. You'd like me to come to your uh, individual community association meetings. I'll be glad to come out and talk. I want to thank you for having me here. The chief is at the other event. Uh, Officer Jernigan, if you know him, he's a sergeant. I'm sorry. Sergeant Jernigan is also at that event. And the reason the chief is there, he's presenting uh, Sergeant Jernigan with the life-saving award for uh, pulling a car, girl out of the car um, that was on fire on the Poe White after it struck a tree. So uh, I think it's a good thing he's out there doing that. We'll get the chief down here to see you. He can tell you about all the fun things that he wants to do. His 100 days will be up by then. Then we'll be into the two-year strategic plan. And I think Richmond's got nothing but good news ahead. Any questions? Could you repeat your phone number? 646-1727. That's my office number. My voicemail broke. I refuse to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll give you one of my cards. Mm -hmm. Councilman, any questions? Uh, before we get the fire department up here, there's just a couple of things I want to point out that we had in our latest newsletter. Uh, one was uh, Richmond police do a vacation watch if you're going out of town. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, is that? That may be Officer Cox's. Um, hopefully, it's nothing serious. Um, but anyway, the Richmond police have a uh, vacation watch program that you can fill out a form and let police know when you're going to be gone, and they will keep an extra eye on your block, on your house. Uh, all you have to do is fill out the form. Uh, Eli has some forms with uh, with us if you are going out of town this summer or on vacation for a little bit. And one of the other things that was in Lieutenant Stiss newsletter was the neighborhood watch so if your neighborhood does not have a neighborhood watch program he can hook you up uh, with the neighborhood watch commander or, or uh, programmer and they will set 
a meeting and let all the neighbors know what it takes to get a program like that going. Uh, we did one over off Leonard Parkway last year uh, when there were there were some break-ins over there. And then as Lieutenant Sis said, shed break-ins are thankfully down. It, it is only June, but but uh, with with Commander Williams and Lieutenant Stiff, we created this little shed secure brochure, uh, which we I, I saw a similar one in Henrico, and, and uh, so we made one of our own. So we've got a ton of them up here. It's got some great safety tips. For example, if you keep a if you have a shed and you keep your bike in it, it may not be covered under your insurance. Uh, there are all kinds of little tips in here that are helpful, and uh, you can can use those to better protect yourself. Uh, you know, if you finish cutting the lawn and you want to go inside and get a glass of water or cold beer and you leave your lawnmower or leaf blower out and uh, somebody might come walking down the alley and decide to take it. And uh, I remember one time I was riding my bike over by the GRTC bus depot and I saw a guy come flying around the corner with a uh, weed eater in his hand on a bike and he, was, he, he almost ran me over. I don't know where he's going in such a hurry with a weed eater, but... I don't, I don't know, I, I'm not casting aspersions, but it was just kind of an odd thing. I've never seen a guy on a bicycle with a weed eater, but anyway. Um, we've got all this stuff up here, and uh, if you have any questions, the commander and lieutenant are, are around. Uh, we've got a couple right here. Um, an observation, a question, an inquiry. Um, on Monday evening, about 3, 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, there was a series of about six to eight short, sharp bangs are going off. I live on Ashlawn Drive. Say again? Ashlawn. Ashlawn. North Ashlawn. Ashlawn. Yeah. Um, both my husband and I thought it's possibly gunfire because it sounded too quick and sharp for a firework, but we weren't quite sure what one should do at 3 a.m. It was flawless. Can you repeat the question, please, because we can't hear The, the question was, on Monday night, they heard some loud uh, explosions, noises that, that resembled possibly gunfire, possibly fireworks, and she asked what should they do, and Lieutenant Stiff. Yeah, just give us a call. We'll come. We'll, we'll, we'll investigate. We'll look around the area, make sure nobody's lying on the ground anywhere, nobody's shot, and you don't have to be seen if you don't want to at 3 in the morning, because I wouldn't want to be seen. Would, uh, we want the police to come and take a look and make sure my neighborhood is safe. Nobody's trying to, uh, you know, get into my house or anything that nature. So. Now, were you come with the, with the lights blaring and the siren going? Yeah, there was no sirens <laughs> No, nothing? So. Nobody but, called? Um, well, on the neighborhood... Um, email? The email, the neighborhood watch thing, um, a couple of other people heard it also from like, Melbourne Gardens as well as, as, well as us. Yes. And some man said that they thought they found some kind of amateur rocket launcher, quotes on quotes. Okay. But yeah. it's good to communicate through the email like that about what's going on. But the first priority should be to call us okay. in a situation like that, so we can look into it and just get an idea of what's going on. Like I said, if you don't want to be seen, we won't come knocking your door at three in the morning. If you want a phone call, we can do that. You brought up a good question. How many people are on next door? Use that. And you know we, the police department, post on next door occasion, okay? Do you know we can't read anything you guys post to each other? We can't get into your neighborhood next door and read the emails that y'all talk about, whether it's lawn care, babysitting, whatever. We can only post and we can only respond to emails that you send to us directly. So we don't have eyes on what's going on next door. So if you're talking to your neighbor about gunshots back and forth, we can't see you. So it's a good thing to know so you know that we're not spying on you. Big Brother's not reading your email, okay? But we won't know if something's going on in your neighborhood unless you should respond directly to it. So that's, that's just the, the non-emergency number we call? Now, for a situation like that, call 911. Because yeah. yeah. you, you were calling because you thought it was gunshots, basically, or an explosion. So we call 911, we'll figure the rest out. Yes, sir. So, so Commander Williams, I just wanted to say publicly what I said to you and Lieutenant uh, Stiff of my email. Thank you very much for all the hard work that y'all are doing in the museum district. This is third year in a row, double digits down year to date. I think it's 34% from what it was in 2012. It's 18 from last year, 20 some percent from the year before. So 
every year you know, just keep going to paying a job better and better. And, and a few grabs here and there, um, some of the other board things and districts here uh, are usually matter grabs. So we really appreciate all that effort and hard work you all Well, we appreciate that. And we only, we're only as successful as you guys allow us to be. Constant communication, you guys so tell us what's going on, Mr. C, makes us better. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about the new roundabouts that are being installed on North Hamilton, just <laughs> off Gary Street. And there are yield signs on the east west, on the Floyd and Elwood, but on Hamilton, there are no yield signs at all. So people drive up to the, the roundabout, expect that anybody's on the roundabout has right away. There's nothing coming from the left. You drive around, but anything coming from the right isn't going to stop because there's no yield sign. Is there, the, 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 the question, question and, and we're going to shift the stage a little bit over here so people can turn this way. I didn't realize it's going to hum like this in the refrigerator. So the question is about the new traffic circles on Hamilton and Floyd when you get up 195. They were put in at the request of the Neighborhood Association. Uh, traffic engineering did some study and found some a lot of speeding actually going on through there. So they installed some traffic circles and the question was about signage. Uh, there's yield signs in, on Hamilton but not on the other direction. The other way around. So uh, that's not really a police question but we'll, we'll pass that along to traffic, traffic engineering. Traffic engineering, we can pass a lot to them. Because they and and get them to come out and they'll, they'll add signage as necessary. Uh, but they seem to, at least on nextdoor.com, they seem to be getting some positive reviews. Um, catch some people off guard and it's a weird intersection because it's so broad that they had to do something kind of out of the ordinary uh, but it seems to work I, mean, I, I know I went through there last week and really had to slow down so. well, what legal is it for people uh, it's called Henry Place it's between Malvern Manor and 195 and Cary and Grove how legal is it to not go around the roundabout and just turn left like I've seen People uh, do. Big trucks can do that. No, this was a regular. Person. Well, it, it's not. It, it, it's not illegal for. I, I did see an 18 wheeler go through there. But uh, that kind of makes correctly, sense. Correctly, correctly, and he, he, you could tell. I was sitting right behind him. You could tell he was kind of figuring out how do I make this work, and he did. Uh, but legally, you know, I think uh, a fire truck or an 18 wheeler can cut it short. But they have to make sure that there's no one coming. Around. I mean, is that an official roundabout? It's a traffic circle. What's the diff What's the definition of difference? Traffic circle is a traffic calming device. A roundabout is is something you would see, more, like the road around the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. If you've ever well, seen yes. that, <laughs> that is a roundabout because yes. it's it's got I believe it's eight different roads, nine different roads that's been off of it. So. It's uh, it's a little bit different. The, There's uh, the Lee statue not around. That's a traffic. It, it's not a roundabout, but they are in, they are planning to upgrade it to roundabout status, which means it will it will flow a little differently. Right now, it's technically I believe it's a traffic circle. It's a traffic circle. They got the stoplights control. Yeah. When they go roundabout. And I'm trying to think of. I know there's a we've got a true roundabout somewhere, but it's escaping me right now. Any other questions for the police? There's just on the roundabout. Oh, sure. I live like right at that intersection, which makes it uh, pretty well. I was worried it was going to drive traffic uh, to the street that I'm actually on, and it's been, you know, I've really seen an increase in five o'clock. Anyways, uh, but while we're on the subject, um, there are <coughs> no union signs, I don't believe, on Hamilton. There's one on Floyd coming off the interstate. That was this gentleman's question too. We said we'd let traffic engineering know to. Uh, my question was, and this is so minor because I know at Henry Place we really appreciate that there's some attention to our neighborhood. Um, this is super duper minor, but if you'll notice, uh, right when you get off the interstate, um, there's Triangle. a part where uh, BDOT doesn't want to cooperate. And uh, for whatever reason, they didn't want us to clear that out. Um, it's, uh, it's not a big deal, but just wondering if there's been any progress on BDOT cooperating to maintain. I saw that on next door. What he's talking about is there's a big triangle there, and the part that's actually owned by the city was landscape, and the part that's owned by VDOT was not. So it's just kind of what grass or weeds or yeah. tall, and so it it's, looks kind of bad. Uh, and so we'll have to figure out a way to make the 
different organizations work together and be happy and you know, finish the landscaping, but we'll get to it. Any other questions? Thank you all three of you Thank for being you, here. Appreciate Thank it. Turn it over to our friends from the fire department, Commander Baumgartner. Hello, it's Rob Baumgartner with the fire department and Jeff Curry. Battalion uh, 2. Jeff Curry is located at uh, Station 18 here. He's your neighbor, resident, battalion chief. Uh, that was a perfect segue for us, by the way, the possible uh, firecracker incident because one of the things, uh, one of the safety items we wanted to talk about tonight our fireworks as we're coming into the summer season. Um, everyone should know that fireworks are illegal in the city of Richmond. Does anybody, can, can you guess what the exceptions to that might be? The diamond no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> 80 games a year. <laughs> For private citizens, the exception is uh, sparklers and the little snakes. But anything that projects or explodes are illegal. Um, if you want to see fireworks like that, we suggest that you go to a show <laughs> where, where the professionals are, are licensed and they have a permit from the fire marshal's office and they're putting on a professional show. Uh, one of the other big things we wanted to touch basically about is, uh, as we're coming into the summer season is, is grill safety. Um, if you have a gas grill and it's been sitting out all winter and you're, and you're ready to use it during the warm weather, we suggest that you take some soapy water and check your grill out for leaks uh, before you use it. If you do cut it on and you smell gas or you find any leaks, um, please please call the, call the fire department. Of course, you can cut the handle off to the, to the valve if that stops it, great. If not, please give us a call. Um, we are happy to report that uh, there's been no major fire incidents in the district recently, which is which is good news. Um, if what we are seeing a big uptick in is water rescues, uh, especially down around the Belle Isle area. You probably see them on the news almost every weekend now. So if you go down to enjoy the river, we ask that you just be very be very careful, be safe. Um, anything over a river level over five feet does require that you wear a light jacket. Um, I brought uh, some copies of our fire and life safety bulletin. We encourage you to pick up a copy as you leave. It gives you some more information about fireworks, uh, about drill safety, and some other safety tips. Anything you like to add? Yeah, one EMS point I like to make. We're transitioning from the colder months into the warmer months. And on the EMS side, um, we like to take care of our senior citizens. So if you have any friends, relatives, or neighbors that are seniors, in the wintertime we worry about exposure, and in the summertime we worry about dehydration. So please, if you have a neighbor with some medical issues or uh, one that you don't see frequently, please check on them. And again, as always, the number one thing you can do to keep yourself safe is to have a working smoke alarm in your home. So please check your smoke alarms. If you do not have a working smoke alarm or need a battery, you can call 646-1526 at 646-1526, and we would be glad to come out and install one for you for free. <coughs> Any questions we can answer for you? So we can come to your home and do a home safety survey. That's okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that for our uh, uh, Well, we can come through your home and uh, the same number, 646-1526. You can request a uh, home safety survey. And it's it's not code enforcement. 
It's not, uh, we're, we're going to write you any tickets or anything like that. We'll just go through and make some suggestions. For instance, if you have uh, some combustible materials too close to your furnace, or if you have an extension cord that runs too long and has too many things plugged into it, or maybe runs under a rug, and we'll just be looking for those those kind of hazards and and all the uh, we'll write them down for you. And like I said, it's, it's just suggestions to keep yourself safe and the code enforcement that goes along with it. And on our form, they'll check for those routine things, and then they'll check anything you ask them to. Any other questions? I just want to confirm, it's kind of scary. Um, in your flyer, you talked about the fact that uh, the 2013 study shows an average 240 people a day yeah. for the emergency room with fireworks related injuries. Right. That's in nation, nationwide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was the city of Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> we have a big problem. We have big problems. Yeah. But yeah, nationwide, 240 people a day uh, during the summer months are injured by fireworks. And a large percentage of those are our children. So it's uh, something we really want to look out for. And you can imagine some of the states, like South Carolina, could sell them legally. Their numbers are way up. You can go south of the border and buy all the fireworks you want. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Thank you both for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>
don't go to the C-Click fix, call us and we will uh, put it into the system and ask Public Works to take care of it. Uh, bus rapid transit on Broad Street, I know this is a hot issue. Uh, it's, it's an issue that's been around uh, growing in the last couple of months. There is a plan to put a dedicated, a couple of dedicated bus lanes in Broad Street. Uh, and in other cities where it's done right, it has had a positive effect on real estate development and uh, density and adding vitality to quarters. One thing we have to keep in mind is Broad Street is probably more vital than it has been since I was a kid. And so we, we want to make sure that there's a, there's a balance there to be kept. So the bus rapid transit project is being funded mostly with a federal grant and state money and Enrico and Richmond. Enrico's putting in a little bit, Richmond's putting in some. And it, it, it is it is a project that could work, but there are a lot of concerns about parking and access to neighborhoods. And I'll give you an example. The original plan, and this is a plan that's being developed. The original plan did not have a left turn between, if you're going west on Broad Street, it didn't have a left turn between Boulevard and Hamilton, which means if you live anywhere around the Channel 6 Tower, you could not make a left turn except the Boulevard or Hamilton, which is nuts. Um, so we've talked to GRTC. They, they're either going to add one in Cleveland or Belmont. They're still working on it. There are a couple of other areas that are of concern, especially in the fan. Uh, there's a lot of access to the neighborhoods. Uh, Scott's Edition looks to be okay, but you know that's in Charles's district. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm worried about the museum district and further west. So uh, we're working on that. The plans that they're supposed to be working on are supposedly 30% complete, and they will have another public meeting in late July uh, down at UR uh, campus downtown. Go, go through those. Uh, if you can see this, Eli, step off to the side. Your head. No, no, go back. This is the route that shows, uh, the, the route runs from Rockets to Willow Long. Uh, it'll, it'll shave a decent amount of time if you've ever ridden the bus down Broad Street. Uh, it'll shave a lot of time off. The trip time, and then go one more, Eli. And you won't be able to see the slide, but uh, you can go to the website on my newsletter. There's a link to all of this information. Uh, the, the pulse line is uh, how it's funded, summary, operating hours, and so forth, and uh, kind of a, a mock design of what some of the stations might look like. It's a little bit different depending on whether you're downtown versus out in our neck of the woods. So. That's a project that is going forward, but I, I encourage everybody to take a look at that because we can't have Broad Street disrupted the way uh, historically Richmond has been disrupted with I-95 and the Downtown Expressway. Uh, and we don't want that to happen to Broad Street. Broad Street's in a good place and it's coming back. We want to make sure that this enhances it and, and doesn't, doesn't hurt it. You said thirty percent of the plans have been made up, so it's a long ways from being a done deal. It, it's a long. The the plan that they had to submit, you know, the federal government doesn't do anything without a lot of strings, and so what they had to submit to the federal government last week was was the the latest of what they've gotten through public input. So what they will present to the planning commission later this summer are the thirty percent designs, and then by the end of the year they will jump to 70%. And then after that, it's, that's why this is now the critical time to make sure that we have access to our neighborhoods and, and make sure that the, it's designed correctly. Because once it gets past the 70, or two to 70 and beyond, it will, it will be hard or expensive to change. And doing all of this in order to get the federal money. Correct, and, and for instance, I'll tell you one thing that, that I learned from GRTC, which doesn't make a whole lot of, well, it makes sense if you know how the federal government works. But there, there's a station at Cleveland, and then the next station is not until almost well, to Staples Mill. And I asked, I said, what about a station at Malvern, uh, you know, near the TJ area and, and uh, those neighborhoods and businesses? And they said, we can only have 14 stations because the grant says we can have 14 stations. They could add a 15th station, but they would have to pay for it. So they could do it two, three, five years down the road. But the grant does not allow for a 15th station, and that's it's a great way to sum up the federal government. 
<laughs> yeah. What section of you know, the plane is now, what section of Broad Street would have the bus being in the center, and what section of Broad Street would have it on the exterior? The, all of that's on the website link, and it shows, for instance, downtown where it's very narrow, it's a, it's a shared lane, and then I believe it's from, I believe it's from uh, Harrison. There's a dedicated lane past Belvedere to no, the dedicated lane. I think it's Thompson to Second Street. Second or Adams, maybe. Maybe Adams. So it's 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 west of a little bit west of Business District, kind of between say uh, November Theater and Belvedere's work into the dedicated lane. But in the really tight areas, like going through Shaco Bottom, it doesn't have a dedicated lane because there's no way. In the center. Parking would be affected in certain areas where there are stations on the side because something's got to give only when there's a state uh, only on the station box. But they, they have worked to originally, I think the number of parking spaces that were going to be lost on the eight mile stretch were 700. Mm -hmm. And now it's down, they say it's down to 100, 100 and something. I, I, I think that's correct. Is that, am I, am I wrong? It's a lot less than 700 to put it that way. Yeah. Any other questions about here? Yes, ma'am. question is, what if somebody wants to come in to the near west end and hop on the bus and ride downtown? And the answer is, we don't know yet. That's one of the questions that we asked here at TC was, are there plans to build a deck or a park and ride lot or, or something? And right now, they don't have any, but that's that's one of the things we have to answer between 30 and 70 percent. Because that is a question, especially, especially in the Scott's Edition neighborhood, which is growing so fast. Uh, with all these changes, BRT is more expensive, and it, it's on one of those slides. I can't remember what it is. I want to say it's 250 instead of 150. It's a little bit more, but um, one way. Uh, I believe I, I, GRTC is switching to one-day passes too. I don't know if that will affect BRT or not. I think all of that is kind of fluid at this point. It, it will be more expensive than a regular bus fare. And, and you buy your tickets. It's kind of like in Europe. You buy your ticket ahead of time. You get on. You punch it rather than pay when you get on. Any one of the of the groups that is offered uh, saying they're going to finance it, if any one of them backs out or changes what they want to do, does that kill the whole thing? I'm not sure. I I think the state is pretty committed. There, the Tiger Grant, I believe, the federal grant is 49 percent, and I believe the state is 25, and so I think. With that kind of money on the table, uh, everybody's pretty committed. It's just a question of finding something that works for everybody. For instance, one of the one of the areas where there's no left turn is Robinson Street. If you're going west on Broad, which is a big collector to the western part of the fan, but it's also buses. Regular buses have to make a left turn there because the three and the four line go up Robinson every 10, 15 minutes. So how? If cars can't make a left turn up Robinson, power buses, what are they going to do yeah. to that three and four route? And that's a question that had been answered yet. Have they done but buses shouldn't be allowed to make a left turn if vehicles can. Because that is, it. Robinson is, it. all of the signalized intersections in the fan, or signalized streets in the fan should be, they are there to collect traffic. Robinson, Meadow, Lombardi, Harrison, all of those are signalized all the way through the fan, and that's where we really need to make sure that are there studies and projections on who is going to ride the bus? There are, uh, and all of, uh, according to what what I was told, all of that information that is going to the feds, the next set of information that's going to the feds has to include traffic studies, uh, volumes, etc., and 
how it'll affect them. So they're supposed to be doing all that, but I, I haven't seen it. Moving on, uh, Grove Avenue, horrible incident in April, uh, very bizarre circumstances with a young man who was going way too fast. Uh, and it's not a normal everyday occurrence of what happened, but it is a reminder that we need to be careful, especially around schools, but also just in areas where there are a lot of bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and that includes this weekend, the Greek Festival starts tomorrow, so Grove Avenue is gonna see all kinds of craziness that we always see every year at this time. Um, as I mentioned last month in the newsletter, the Safe Routes to Schools program, waiting for VDOT's approval, that's going to make some improvement on expanding the, the flashing 25-mile-per-hour uh, zone. Uh, it's going to better mark crosswalks. It's going to add a couple of traffic circles on Commonwealth. Uh, it's not going to do anything to affect what happened. That was a, a very strange incident. Uh, and, and there's, there's not much we can do about it, but uh, we did receive a lot of emails after that uh, from not just people around the school, but all around that general area. And we gave, I had a meeting with the traffic engineer who came on, uh, uh, Mike Sawyer, if you know him, he, he was with the city years ago, and he came back when Tom Flynn retired. He's, he's, a, he's a great guy, and he, he gets all of the, the challenges that we have especially in, in today's environment where people want to walk more and they want to be out more uh, bicycling and walking in their neighborhood. So uh, he's going to look at a lot of these suggestions with the staff and they're going to go over uh, what they can do to improve safety, not just around the school, but everywhere, but certainly in that area because it put a lot, what happened put a lot of people on the edge. So any questions about that? Uh, the budget, yeah, the budget's done. Uh, by, by law, the budget has to be done by May 31st. We got it done two weeks early. We got it done two Fridays ago, and uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, the mayor still has two days to veto it, but uh, hopefully that won't happen. Uh, I, as you can see on the screen, I think there were three main themes in the budget that we heard a lot of people talk about. One is fund schools because they need it. Uh, a lot of facilities problems. Uh, we've got a, a, a new team under Dr. Benton and his executive staff that have really kind of mapped out, charted a course of, of where the school system needs to go to get better, uh, which we all know it needs to do. And so we funded schools an extra $9 million in the general fund for operating expenses, and we funded uh, them $18 million so they can get started on school planning and construction. Look at some of the documents the school system has out. Excuse me. Most of the growth, if not all of the growth, in the school system is on foul side. And I'll give you an example of what went wrong. When when they decided five years ago to build four new schools, they built Broad Rock Elementary on South Side, and it was built to hold about 500 students, and it's got about 650. It's our, and they're adding trailers this summer because it is exploding in population growth around that neighborhood. They didn't plan very well to handle the increased enrollment, but schools all over Southside are growing. And so the $18 million will enable them to help. Uh, it'll help with the crisis. Trailers are gonna be part of life in a couple schools for the next few years, but it will. Westover Hills is the school that is almost at capacity, they're gonna be able to put an addition on that school, close another school and combine the two. Uh, and, and the facilities report is very complicated, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but it is a well thought out document that's about, literally about this big, weighs about 100 pounds. Uh, and they looked at everything and they have come up with a plan uh, that, that the school board still has to approve, but seems to make the most sense, but they're gonna, they are gonna need a lot of money, and it's about a 15, more realistically, probably about a 20 year uh, plan for implementation, but we can get it done, and, and that's why it was important to, to fund the $18 million. The other eight million that we gave the schools was for maintenance, which is things like roofs and HVAC and things like that. 
Um, we, we had a joint meeting with the school board yesterday and facilities director for public schools, Tommy Cran, said they've got two comprehensive high schools, i.e. TJ, John Marshall, uh, he didn't say which ones, but the big high schools that have HVAC problems. And if one of them goes down, they have nowhere to move the students because there's not enough capacity at the other schools to, to just throw everybody in there. So he says they cross their fingers and pray a lot that, that that's not going to happen. So this $8 million will help go uh, to fix that, we hope, over the summer uh, and, and not make that fear a reality. Um, and then the second biggest item was the reinstitution of the, the STEP program and the career development for police and fire. Police, back about seven or eight years ago, police and fire instituted a, a, a STEP program that pays officers that earn certain levels of education and advancement. Some people can choose to stay at a certain level, some can take classes and professional development move on. Uh, that program has been stopped or frozen for five in the last six years. And we're starting to lose a lot of good officers, a lot of good men and women in the counties and other jurisdictions. And we wanted to make sure that they know that we are uh, we are behind them. And I think it all of this was in motion before what happened in Baltimore happened. And it, it shows the importance of having a well-trained, well-disciplined, and well-rewarded police force. You want as professional force as you can get, and we need it. We're lucky we've got a great community policing uh, program where the neighbors, you know, they, they know the police, they're comfortable with the police in their neighborhood, and that's helpful. Uh, we've got a great fire department, and we need to make sure that that public safety sector is serving us because if you're a victim of crime or if your house is on fire, you want the best you can get coming to respond to that incident. And so we thought that was a very important part of the budget and, and we, were, we were proud to, to get that through. And then the third thing is we were flying blind. Um, the comprehensive annual financial report is still not done should have been delivered to the state in November and should have been delivered to council in December. It still has not been delivered to the external auditor. Uh, and so once it gets to the external auditor, you're looking at three or four weeks probably at least until we get the final report. So we don't know if there's any money left over from fiscal year 14. Uh, it's just a, you know, I, the mayor deserves credit. We've had six bond upgrades in the last six years, but this is a serious issue that does not look well on the city uh, not having this done. There's been a lot of turnover in the finance department and it, you know, they've got some good people in there now but they're cleaning up so much that was left uh, that hopefully it won't affect us but it was a challenge not knowing for sure uh, how, how solid the numbers were. Hey, how um, do you deal your budget if you don't have that kind well, of information? Well, we, 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 you, you don't need the CAFR to complete the budget technically, but it does help because if there is money left over that you can use for certain things, then you know, they, they predict that there will be about a $300,000 surplus, but last year, if I remember correctly, last year there wasn't much of a surplus and then there were some amendments introduced that were passed and then all of a sudden $9 million appeared. So um, I'm not saying that's going to happen this year, I'm just, it happened last year. That would be very nice. Um, and nobody can read that, but I'll run through a list of, uh, usually we have a much bigger screen upstairs, and I, I forgot to compensate for that, that's my fault. Um, just some of the other amendments that I put in uh, that were approved, uh, $450,000 more for capital improvements in James River Park, city's number one tourist attraction. Uh, there are a couple of access points, if you've ever been down there, those there's three bridges over the railroad tracks, one at Texas Beach and two, on the, one at 22nd Street and one at 41st Street. And they go over the concrete bridges to go over the railroad tracks and you can access the river that way. Those are in major need of repair. Uh, and so uh, I work with Nathan Burrell, who runs the park system, to get some money in there uh, for those things. 
simple things like water fountains and a couple of other capital improvement projects that are needed in the park. Um, 1.5 million for the riverfront plan. Uh, we, we spent about 100 and I want to say $180,000 about four years ago on the riverfront plan to develop it. And in the last two years, there hasn't been money put in to keep it going, which is so typical Richmond. We come up with a plan and it's great, and then we move on to something else. Uh, so last year, the council added a couple million dollars for the riverfront plan to keep moving. We put another 1.5 in this year. Uh, and that's important. People let us know that's important, so we don't want it to stall. Um, TJ's athletic field for football and soccer and phys ed, uh, we had an opportunity uh, to, the Redskins are offering a $200,000 grant to be matched with a nonprofit grant if we could raise the balance. So the city, had, we put in an amendment, or I put in an amendment for 200 more. So we've got about total, we've got about 680,000, assuming we get the grant, which we should, uh, out of about 750 that's needed. So we're, we're very close and we're working on some private sources to, uh, to close the gap. Uh, but, but that 200 was important to get. I mean, we, we, we're putting in 200, but we're getting 400 for free. So um, that's a no-brainer. Um, I see Lisa's here. We got $500,000 for a addition to the West End Library. Uh, that's been long planned and delayed for various reasons. But we, we talk with Lisa and Harriet and Capital Projects, and they're going to the city bought those two lots next to the Western Library when the plan was to tear down the library and put in a, a big renovate, a big new structure, which was much bigger. And then 2008 hit, and everything went out the window. So the old plan came back, and it was just a renovation of the existing building. But it's the second big, busiest branch in the library system after the main main library on Franklin Street. So we worked with capital projects. We came up with a thousand square feet in addition. Doesn't sound like much, but it would take a lot of heat off of uh, space pressure. And add a little garden and a thousand foot addition. And uh, that will be, it will be started next year and completed in uh, fiscal year 2017. So it'll probably be done by the end of 2016. Uh, so that'll be coming to Patterson Avenue. Uh, we added $200,000 for pedestrian crossings only, not traffic circles, which are, come from a different pot of money. Just for things like crossing enhancements, uh, flashers, and things like that. Is that the brick thing? It depends on the crossing. Um, crossings can cost anywhere from you know, a couple thousand dollars to 25 or 30 if you get the real fancy. The real fancy ones are more expensive with the uh, the lights and the flashing lights and the pavement. But, uh, you know, this is a start because we, we have a lot of pedestrian issues across the city. Um, three, three million dollars for the Slave Heritage Site, which is meant mostly for the area, well, intended for the area north of Broad Street, where the old parking lot is. It's now a grass lot, and they want to, the idea is to create a memorial park. If you've ever, there's one in New York City, there's one in Amsterdam. Uh, there's some really powerful um, places that memorialize what went on as far as slavery is concerned, and certainly in Chaco Bottom that needs to be memorialized. So um, the reason we moved that money in there is, you know, Charles and I tried to take the $10 million that was in for the Chaco Bottom infrastructure for the stadium and, and move it to the schools, and the mayor promised that it was for the Slave Heritage Site, and when the budget came out, Ten million dollars was still there for the Shaco infrastructure for the stadium, so we decided to move move it to the Slate Heritage site uh, instead. Uh, the hundred thousand, Kathy Graziano and I put a hundred thousand dollars in the general fund for more staff for James River Park. Believe it or not, uh, Nathan I think does that with four, three or four people. The whole the whole park, and a lot of volunteers seasonally. But can't keep up. So that, that'll get him two more staffers, which he needed. And then $100,000, the administration cut the urban forestry budget, staff budget, $150,000. Those guys can't keep up as, as it is. So we've got $100,000. We should be able to add another team to at least keep them treading water. 
uh, and, and hopefully, you know, they're, they're behind as it is, and uh, you know, we've got a great urban canopy, but we can't afford to fall behind anymore. I'm going to take a break real quick and invite Warren. Warren, sorry. Um, he emailed me yesterday about uh, wanting to uh, speak to you all a little bit about uh, the TJ Viking Fund, and so I'm going to turn the floor over to, to him. Thank you, John. Again, my name is Warren Pierce, a um, product of the Richmond City Schools. I haven't been back in this building since 1972. <laughs> if you have any interest, my, my class picture is hanging outside of the um, <laughs> principal's office. <laughs> it's going to be outside of the principal's office for once. But I'm here with uh, Russell Flamia who was my soccer coach at Thomas Jefferson High School back in 1976. So um, I'm not as old as some of you, but I'm older than some of you. <laughs> but uh, after having gone through the Richmond Public Schools and done my time as a citizen, many of us in the neighborhood and many of us in the alumni group decided it was time for us to give back. And one of the ways was that um, we organized with the help of many of the alumni, the Thomas Jefferson Viking Fund. So back in April of 19, 2012, a group of Thomas Jefferson High School alumni, neighbors, came together to establish the TJ Viking Fund. It's a not-for-profit 501c3 organization. Our mission is to focus on the philanthropic, the financial support, and the interests of scholastic athletics music, art, and science, trying to culminate all the needs within the student body. So over the year, since 19, since 2000, 2012, we have raised over $140,000 and have accomplished many impressive um, projects. We've been able to solicit and grow enthusiasm, encouragement, and support from the community and the businesses. The fundamental goal of the Vikings Fund is to encourage and challenge alumni and community business involvement in the lives of the students attending the neighborhood school. As a plug, on August 20th, at the Westminster Presbyterian Church, one of our partners, the TJ Viking Fund, will be conducting its third annual football fundraiser. This event will help us provide necessary football equipment for the football team as well as provide additional funds for our organization to continue our ongoing effort. The TJ Viking Fund, just to give you an idea, has assisted in the purchase and the erection of a new marquee and beautiful landscaping made possible by Hunt and Williams Law Firm. And if you haven't been driven by the intersection of West Grace and Malvern, we've got a wonderful new marquee there that we're very, very proud of. We've helped in the purchase of several ping pong tables, table tennis. We purchased uniforms for football, basketball, cheerleading. And with the help of the Mary Munford PTA and youth soccer, we've been able to get soccer uniforms and various pieces of soccer equipment. We've been able to purchase and erect the football and soccer scoreboard, which is there on the football field. We've been able to purchase and erect bleachers. We've renovated the locker rooms. We've established and created a wonderful uh, weight room for all of the students. We've been able to purchase snacks for various, various athletic events and SOL testings for the students. So many of you here are parents and probably grandparents of many Richmond Public School students and Thomas Jefferson is likely the high school that your student is currently attending or will eventually attend. So it's the goal of our Viking Fund to have Thomas Jefferson provide the best programs possible for your children's development. But that can only be possible with your support. The needs are great, and the Viking Fund is turning to you to help us identify and fulfill those needs. So if you'd like to know how to support and to be a supporter and get involved, please contact John or visit us on Facebook. 
Um, I've got a couple of flyers if you're interested in a, if you're a business owner and would like to make a contribution for a silent auction that's a part of our event, I've got some information. And Russell has got a couple of flyers that uh, if you'd like a little bit of information, we'd be happy to uh, provide you. Thank you very much, John. You have any questions? Mark, have they uh, selected a guest speaker for this year yet? We've got a wonderful guest speaker. It's going to be Coach Chad Hornet. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. And we're going to incorporate some of our student athletes in the program. So it's going to be a, a different program, but we think a very much more informative and educational program for uh, everybody involved. Thank you. And, and if, if you don't, if you don't know, Chad has been in PJ for the last few years and really reinvigorated that football program and uh, took them to their first playoff game in 20 some years. And uh, they uh, they really are doing a great job over there. And and I, I didn't realize this. I would like to point out that Russell was. Um, Honored by the Richmond Public Schools Education Foundation. Was it earlier this month or last month? April. Yeah, it was late April uh, at the Jefferson. And he was honored for his service to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he not only attended it, but he taught there for 34 years and he's been volunteering since he retired. So uh, there's nothing that goes on at that school uh, with, without him knowing about it. And he is. Uh, He's been a real, real advocate for TJ, and we thank him for that. Thank you, John. I've spent 48 years of my adult life uh, at TJ. 34 as a teacher, 14 as a tutor for SOL students, and three years as a student there. So I have a long history there, but it's been very rewarding, and it's just my way of giving back to the Thomas Jefferson community. And we appreciate it, all the help that we've been given over the years. Um, and it's just been a good experience to get back. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. Thank you, Russell. Uh, I'm going to rapid fire through a couple of things. We're ahead of schedule, which is good. Uh, Greek Festival, like I mentioned earlier, starts tomorrow, so watch out for all kinds of bedlam on Grove and Malvern. Um, and actually, all over the place, not just Grove and Malvern. Um, Stella's Grocery, speaking of all things Greek. Stella's Grocery is now open. I confess I still haven't been in there, which is a shame, but I will get in there. It's on Lafayette Street across from the restaurant, and uh, it's really going to be a great neighborhood market, and um, I encourage everybody to visit. We now have three food truck courts in the first district. One starts next week, but uh, there's one at Mary Munford every Tuesday. There's one at St. Giles every Wednesday, and the one that starts next week on Monday, every Monday, is behind in the parking lot behind Temple Bethel at Grove and Rosemead. So use it as an excuse to get out of the kitchen and, and go hang out with your neighbors. Uh, they all run from 5.30 to 8. The trucks that show up, I think, vary from place to place and day to day, but uh, you're guaranteed to find something good that you don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning. Uh, this is one of my favorite things in the district and in the city, uh, Shakespeare at Agecroft. Uh, it is one of the one of the better events, I believe, in the city. I'm, I'm not sure of any other 15th century Tudor estate in the country that hosts Shakespeare in the summertime. Uh, and it is a great lineup this year, Much Ado About Nothing in Hamlet. So uh, it, it really is worth visiting if you get a chance. And it's the only time that you can come and hang out and picnic on the lawn at H Croft, so I encourage you. Performance starts at 8, right as the sun goes down. Is it 7.30? Thanks, Chris. Um, so, I better fix that, because I had 7.30. Oh, it is? Okay. Uh, but it is a lot of fun, so I encourage everybody to, to give it a look. Um, the Museum District Family Picnic is right across the street on Friday, June 12th. Uh, come on out. And hang out with your neighbors the last day of school uh, so it, it's a great picnic and uh, encourage everybody to come uh, bring a chair blanket they'll have where'd Stephen go who's doing the food this year Chipotle to, oh they're doing it again okay so yeah oh that's right yeah so they'll have an ice cream truck so come on out with some ice cream and some, some Chipotle and uh, go ahead and then uh, Another one of my favorite things is British soccer, and the Richmond Kickers are bringing in the one of the 
teams from the British Barclays Premier League again this summer. Last year they hosted uh, one of the teams and sold out 8,000 people. Um, so this year we'll probably sell out again. It's a great, great opportunity to see some of the best in the world uh, come and play against the Richmond Kickers, and that's on July 19th. But I wouldn't wait till then to get tickets because it'll probably sell out before then. And then, of course, can't end a meeting without encouraging everybody to use cclickfix and nextdoor.com and raids online to look, uh, to talk to your neighbors, report bottles or whatever, and, uh, and raids online is a great resource that the police use to, uh, to show you where crime is happening. If you really dig into it, it's great. There's all kinds of ways that you can analyze what time of day crimes are being reported, uh, what days of the week, things like that. So it, it's, it really is uh, very helpful. And that's all I've got for today. So I'll be happy to take questions, anything generally or something that we didn't cover. Nothing? Yes, ma'am. We have a problem with the trash collectors not putting the cans back okay. uh, in the alleys. And where I live, their garage is running out behind me, so it's a lot of traffic. Right. So you have to get out of your car and move the can, put the top down. And yesterday, I went by and picked up a five-gallon bucket, half full of trash that didn't pick up. Okay. Just drop it. If you let Eli know, and we'll let Public Works know that they need to, to tend to that, especially what, what alley or where, where is it? 3300 Kensington, Stewart. Okay. 3400 Stewart. Okay. Let us know, and we'll make sure that they. Where, wherever it is, let us know. We'll, we'll report it. Anything else? Yes, sir. I know you never get tired of talking about the budget, John. Um, what are some of the projects and things in that $1.7 million from the Riverfront plan you can spend on? Well, according to Mark Olinger, because I asked Mark, I said, you know, how much how much should we put in the Riverfront plan? $1 million, $2 million. And he said, well, one point five could would allow them to do a lot of the work uh, on the east end of the river, riverfront towards the, uh, where the Lehigh cement silos are, so on Chapel Island in that general area. And, and it was, they really hadn't planned on it because it hadn't been, but last year wasn't budgeted past the amendment that we put in for one year. It wasn't budgeted three, four years out. So it wasn't something that was on the radar, but it was something that they can get going for 1.5. So it's not it's not a huge thing like what they're doing up towards Browns Island with the, the bridge across the dam walk across the the river and things like that and over on Manchester. But it is something to keep the plan moving, and then we'll worry about next year, next year to keep to figure out what phases are that. Yes, ma'am. I just uh, was wondering why do we need uh, five banks in a radius of four blocks. <laughs> That's a good question. I, the, the banks <laughs> sure like. And I understand that they're going to build another one where Sitco Station was near the. Uh, I I don't cleaners. know. If they, I I haven't heard that, but uh, Handcraft Cleaners bought the old gas station, so I don't. I know they're using it right now for parking for the neighborhood, but I don't know what their plans are. I haven't heard anything. I have. I don't know. I'm not sure if it would require a special use permit or not, but uh, I haven't heard anything about that property. Uh, and as for the banks, you know, that, that is becoming quite popular. But I know it is. But it's good to have active Thank uses of buildings. <laughs> that pay taxes. Anything else? Thank you all for coming. I'll be around for a few minutes if you have any Oh, yeah, they're